It's good to be here in the house of the Lord, worshiping Him and praising His name. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible to Joshua chapter 3. The title of the message today would be Follow the Ark. It's a bit unusual name, I know, but we are going to continue what we've been um, expanding on the book of Joshua. And the book of Joshua, we, we see this transition, and this transition is happening to the people of Israel. In some sense, we have a transition happening in our local community. But the point of the book of Joshua is to say that Jesus is our true Joshua that will never fail and will conquer his enemies and will take us to his promised land and we will follow him. Amen. Amen. But I don't know how many of you have pets. Actually, I was back there with my family and... Forgot to say one thing. Today we have junior church, so the kids can uh, can go. So I don't know how many of you have pets, but uh, last year, I think it was no 2021, we had a little puppy, very stubborn puppy. And I was looking on YouTube how to train a dog. I failed, yeah. But the thing, one of the techniques is, is called, for a little puppy, it's called follow the leader. And you go to a wide open place. You don't use, like, leash or anything with the dog. Just leave the dog there, and you walk. You just walk because there's that instinct in the puppy, that survival instinct that the puppy feels weak and needs to be protected by someone bigger. Usually, a big dog, it's mom, or, or, but in the, in the case, we're training him, so the, the, the puppy sees in us that safe place and follow us. But isn't that funny that even in the animal kingdom, there are some instincts that they, they, they feel and they follow because they want to survive. And in fallen human race, now, everybody wants to do their own things individually. Everybody wants to be their own God. They don't want opinion from anyone. I just want to do, be myself or, or decide for myself what I have to do, right? But in this story of Israel, we will see that the need, the people, as, as a survival need to follow God's commandments to follow the Ark of the Covenant. And there's one specific purpose. I asked you to open in Joshua chapter 3, but that goal will be the last verse of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 24, says like this. The goal of the people in crossing the Jordan is that the Lord, uh, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. That's the goal of this crossing. So let's pray. Father, we ask you that what we know not, please, teach us. What we have not, please, give us. And what we are not, please, make us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we walk through the book of Joshua, we start to feel that this story is getting up to a climax, right? People are getting near and near the, the promised land, this land that was promised even in Genesis 12 to Abram. His name was not even Abraham yet. So we see how God, like we saw in chapter 1, how God commissioned Joshua, how he chose him. He told me, you need to keep your eyes, you need to, to be strong and courageous, look at the law, meditate on it day and night. And we saw how he was chosen to be uh, this 
continuity from Moses' uh, uh, prophet ministry, servant of the Lord ministry. And then we saw in chapter 2 how beautifully God covenants with Rahab. This prostitute that becomes part of the people of Israel. How beautiful is that? She became the mother of Boaz. That's amazing. And the picture of Boaz, how he, he, the redemption he brings uh, to Ruth. And, and in the next stories will tell that. But this is amazing. That God is, all, is, is always showing his grace and mercy even to this pagan people that confesses and repent before him. So what we desire to unpack here in this story in chapter 3 is, is this majestic act of God that he, he's showing us his great power. He's showing us how great he is, but he, he's also uh, telling us the necessity of following the guidance in the crossing of Jordan. So in, in, in this, this is the first time in the book of Joshua that we have the Ark of the Covenant mentioned. And just like that, the ark takes this, this main character place. The, the presence of God, the, the ark of the covenant of God with his people. So uh, we know that it, it represents God's presence, but it's more than that. It represents his covenant with his people. So God is committed, like he has a commitment to his people. He has promised things to these people. Not based on their, 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 the things they deserve, we do not deserve, but based upon the grace and mercy of Him who is merciful and graceful. So He is the one who leads His people. This book is not about Joshua nor the people of Israel. This book is about God. The whole book is about God. So we need to um, see that in that story as well. So we will divide, we'll, we'll divide into three parts this chapter. Part one uh, will be from, from verses one to four uh, that we must follow uh, God with our eyes fixed on the ark. Then our second part will be from verses five to 13 that we must follow according to his instructions. And then finally, from verses 14 to 17, we'll see that we must follow even when it's inconvenient. So remember, the main thing here is that God will lead the crossing. It's God who will lead the crossing. And we must follow him. So how will that truth guide us today? How will that truth lead us into the following of the promises of God for us individually, for us as church, for us as members of the body of Christ. So let's read verses 1 through 4. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Chittim, and they came to the Jordan. He and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cub cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know that the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before." So the, the leaving the, the city of Shittim, which we saw that was the city that in Numbers 25, they were hoard, they hoard with the daughters of Moab in, in there. So they sinned against God. They, they leave that city early in the morning. Joshua received great news from the spies that the people are fearing, the people are scared, and he saw that someone in there helped them and, and put the scholar's cord. We saw all that. So uh, uh, he knows, Joshua knows that the Lord is with him. Do you know that feeling that you have something big coming up? You know that feeling? I had that feeling when my kids were born. I was in the hospital uh, waiting to go into the, the uh, surgery place. Because it was all six sessions for my kids. And that feeling of something big is about to happen. I know it. But 
It's a, it's a fear. I was afraid that something would happen to my wife or to the baby. I didn't know what's going on. But, but at the same time, it, it was an indescribable joy that was about to come. And it's a mixture. Have you ever felt like that? When, I don't know, it was the first time speaking public. Sometimes maybe a child that was being born, a grandchild. Um, what I'm trying to bring here is that idea of something big is going to happen for Israel. Something big. And they're getting there. They're, they're walking towards the promise. This, and remember, only, uh, only Joshua and Caleb they were the ones that were in the crossing of the Red Sea. They, they only lived journeying in the desert. This is the new generation. So they only hear about the stories of God. They only hear about what a great prophet Moses was. They even lived with him a little, but Joshua is the one leaving them. So in verse, in verse 3, the officers bring some directions to the people. And what was not, not in the story now, before, now enters in the story. And it's the Ark of the Covenant. When they see the Ark passing by, then they must follow it. But why? God wants us his golden box, which represents his presence, his covenant with his people to pass before them. And this is uh, a perfect illustration that God is like practically showing them that I am taking you to this land. I am leading the way. You can only pass when I tell you to pass. You can only go wherever I tell you to go. It's God leading the people into the land. So God's presence was with Moses in the desert. He's leading the people to the land. He goes before God. Remember that? What Moses prayed? Please, Lord, don't make me go without your presence. We cannot go without your presence. We need to be guided by your presence. So that's what God does. God is leading the people into the promised land. But look at the ark. Don't lose sight of the ark. Look at my presence. Look at God. Don't look to your right or to your left. Look at the ark. There is uh, another direction that God gives. They needed to stay away 2,000 cubits. That distance for us is not, uh, it's like Brazilians trying to learn miles and, and foot, you know. Cubits is so strange. But that's like a little bit more than half a mile, 3,000 feet. So they need to stay away from the ark. And to be honest, when I first read this text, um, for me, it was like, oh, because God's holy and his presence, no one can touch the ark. I remember the story in the second chronicle, first chronicles um, about Uzzah and stuff like that. But that's not what the text tells us. It's very practical. They needed to stay away from the ark. Why? Because it. Everybody needed to see the ark. So we have millions, two million people maybe. So everybody needs to see the ark. That's why they need a, a distance. And God says, um, and the prophets, the, the officers tell something that's important. Because you have not passed this way before. You have not passed this way. This is new for you. You need guidance. You need the leadership of God. So so far, this is the high point of our story. People uh, need to keep their eyes on, on um, the ark. And this God who does great wonders in the Red Sea with, with jo Joshua and Caleb. Now, this would also be a bit traumatic for them because it's a big change. And as people, we don't react well with changes, right? We are afraid of change. We want things the way they are we want things the way to keep the same because we're we have a natural fear of the unknown and that's why we need to keep our eyes in the ark because even though it's something that we have not passed before it's the unknown our safe place even when things changed is the presence of god that is with his people God is holding his people and protecting them and leading them no matter what changes is going to happen. 
So God is the leader of these people. So what can we do with that truth today into our lives? How can we apply that part? So as the people of Israel had to literally focus their attention to the Ark of the Covenant, we must, as people of God, do the same spiritually. The Ark is the most significant object in the Old Testament. Did you know that? In the, their time of worship. Is, is that box in the most high place, a golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant? The, the three things that represent God's presence with his people in the Old Testament. The mercy seat, the top of the ark, had two um, cherubims, two angels facing each other, looking down at the presence of God. And this mercy seat that once a year, the high priest would come and sprinkle blood in that part where the angels were looking at. And this means when the presence of God comes and he accepts the worship, he forgives the nation of Israel. He gives them a pardon for a year, and then the next year they have to come again. But this is also pointing to someone in the New Testament, isn't it? The Ark of the Covenant is telling us a story. The Ark, the presence of God. That Jesus would come and he would die. And, but this time, he would be the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. What was interesting for me, it was overwhelming to see that in the Gospels, in John chapter 20, verse 12, when Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, what does she find in there? She finds two angels, one at the feet and one at the head where, of the place where Jesus was. The perfect sacrifice for us. Jesus was the perfect. There was no need for another sacrifice. Now, the, the, the presence of God, we have access of, the, of God's presence. And when he died on the cross, the curtain uh, ripped from top down. And now, because of Jesus, we can look at, look at him and be safe. We can look at him and have direction. So when we look at his finished work on our behalf, he was perfect and acceptable sacrifice before God. We need to look at this mess message constantly. Look at this message. The gospel is not for unbelievers. We need to uh, always look at him. That's the message of God, the gospel. When you have your eyes fixed on Jesus, you need to submit. You submit to his guidance, to his word to his commands. It's not about you anymore. It's about following our Jesus, our master. And if this church is not following Jesus, it will not be sustained. If this church has not the eyes focused on our Savior, there will be no programs, no activities that we can go and will sustain us. Because Jesus is the one who holds the universe together. He is the head of the church. He is the one who leads us. He is our true and perfect Joshua. So we saw that we need to keep our eyes on the ark. But we must also follow the ark according to his instructions. Let's read verses 5 through 13. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand, and still, stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to all the people of Israel, Come, hear and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from uh, before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. 
Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Amen. So, after the officers had spoken to the people about following the ark, Joshua steps in and say, you need to consecrate yourself. To consecrate is to separate yourselves. We see that in Exodus 19, when Moses is about to, to go up the Sinai. But it's a, it was a ritual of, of washing that they had. So, uh, he asked the people to wash their garments and to consecrate because an intervention of God was going to happen. God was going to act in the middle of this, his people, and he's a holy God, and we need to be holy before him. So, but before we talk about holiness, we see in verse 7 that God says, I will exalt you, Joshua. And a lot of prosperity preachers or, or you know, these guys that preach that about humans in the center say that, okay, God wants to exalt you. If you give this much, I will exalt you in the middle of, in front of everybody. It's like the devil's promises to Jesus, right? Um, but pay attention how God says he will exalt him. I will exalt you so everyone will know that the same way I was with Moses, so I will be with you. In Joshua chapter 1, we see more than three times God mentioning Moses. And he tells that Moses is the servant of God. Moses is the the servant of God. And in the end of the book of Joshua, he mentions that Joshua is the servant of God. Actually, God's exaltation to someone is putting in the servanthood place. God's exaltation is putting us in the right place before him. When God exalts us, it means I'm going to put in a place that you're going to serve me and take my people with you to serve me. So we'll be known as the people that serve the Lord. This is God's exaltation to us. And we should be honored when we're called to serve. Did you know that as Christians in a local church, as Christians, we are not called to be served. We are called to follow our master. We are called to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. In Mark chapter 10, when John and James wants to sit on the right and the left of Jesus, what they say, Jesus, please take us there. We want to see uh, near, what do they want? They are thinking with the worldly mindset. They want to be recognized by the world. They want to be seen as authorities and important people. Jesus says the world is looking for that in Mark chapter 10. The world's looking for this pomp, this glory. But what does Jesus say? He says, This will not be with you. Whoever wants to be the first will be the last. Whoever who wants to be in high place will be in the servant place. Because this is how I called you to be. I did not call you to be served. I called you to serve. How can you serve others in this congregation? How can you serve others to grow in their relationship with Jesus? So Joshua will be known the same way that Moses was with, was with God. Joshua was with God. And Look at what Joshua tells the people then. Joshua does not say, hey guys, you're going to see now how God is going to exalt me. God is going to make me a great person. You'll see that, but what he'll do, and he put me this in this leadership to be the great guy. Now, Joshua invites them and says, hey, come here. Let's listen to the word of our God. Let's listen to the Lord, your God. That's what leadership does. Hey, come, listen to the Lord. Listen to the word. We are to bring people into this reality. We are submitted to his word. 
And the verb that uh, God, when God is telling about exaltation of Joshua, God says that they will know that I am with you. This verb know in the original is not talking about necessarily the cognitive knowledge, like information. It, it's more like an experience. I remember when, when, I, when I was a kid and I would do some bad behavior, you know, with my mom. And she's like, when we get home, you will know what's good for you. So this no, I knew that was an experience. I was going to, you know, find some new experience at home. So it's not learn cognitively. It's learn, like, know something. And, and, and the Lord's saying, they will know that I am with you. Joshua invites them to, to um, listen to the word of God. And he tells them that the God will drive out all these peoples from their promised land. Right? God will, and then all the names that are difficult to pronounce. The Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, and so on and so forth. But wait a minute. God will drive them out of the, the land? Or the people will fight and they will win against them? What, which one is true? And the answer is yes. Both reality God can do. So God can work miracles and do great things among the, his people. And God can send his people to conquer the land. So we can trust in a God that can heal a person instantly. Or God can use medications that he gave human knowledge and intelligence to uh, work on that person. God is God. He's not limited or he does not work the way we want him to work. God is God. So uh, Joshua wants the people to know what God will do. But before, before he says what they will do, he says who this God is, right? He's the Lord of all the earth. And this is it, it's interesting because it's similar to Rahab's confession. She's like, in chapter 2, she says, I know that your God is the God of heavens and God of all the earth. God of, God of the earth. It brings us, the more we know our God, we know how powerful he is. It's like Job, in Job 42, verse 2, that says, Who is like you, O Lord? No, Exodus, sorry. Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? I could go on verse by verse by verse in every book of the Bible saying how great and good and amazing our God is. And this is the right place we have to be. We need to look at who he is before what he does. When you start, you start your uh, morning or, or, or your time of devotion... In, in, at home, when you're reading the Bible, start by praising Him for who He is. God, I love you because you're God of wonders. You're mighty. You're powerful. Who is like you, God? Who is like you? How can we use these instructions for ourselves now? All the directions that God gives to His people. We begin with holiness. Joshua told them to consecrate themselves. So, uh, the, the church has been controversial about the subject because... Some don't understand what holiness means. And they try to live in a legalistic lifestyle. They try to live in a don't do that, don't do this, do this lifestyle. Joshua called the people to consecrate themselves. And Jesus, our true and better Joshua, was perfect before the Father. Our holiness before our God is not dependent upon us us we rest in the holiness of god because god's jesus righteousness was imputed to us through jesus our holiness that allows us to stand before god it's only access through faith in jesus and when we believe in jesus we are made holy because of his holiness so we need to stop pretending to be a holy person, trying with our own effort to be holy. We 
achieve and we become into this mature Christian, this mature holy person because of God's grace and because he is working through us and through the Spirit. But it's not anything that we can say we earn this. We rest in Jesus' holiness. There's a book, a Christian classic book called Holiness by J.C. Ryle. And he says that the fear of punishment, the desire of reward, the sense of duty are all useful arguments for holiness in their way. Um, they are useless, sorry. They are useless arguments in their way to persuade people to holiness. But they are powerless until a person loves Christ. We can only be holy when we delight in Christ. We can only be holy when we rest upon His grace. So the lifestyle of holiness is not, is not that struggle of teenagers, you know, teenagers trying not to, to uh, watch pornography or, you know, this, oh, I have to be holy, I have to be holy, I have to be holy, this, this way. No, it's not about that. I'm not saying that holiness is only for teenagers or for kids to obey their parents. I'm saying all of us, we need to be holy before God. And holiness is not, is not uh, about not doing things. It's about loving and delighting and, and resting upon the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. The more we love him, the more we're going to hate the things he hates. It's not, it's not about focusing on the, non, the, the negative things that you don't do. It's focusing on loving Jesus more. And having more relationship with him. The delight in Jesus. So if we love God, we will stop sinning. But not perfectly because we're still in the, this flesh. But we will grow in holiness. So the, the, the word is confronting us to live in holiness. In, in a way that we fully live for his, for his glory. But... Are you ready to follow him even when sometimes it's inconvenient? This is the third point. It's, it's verses 14 through 17. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, as, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its bank throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that, it, that is beside Zarethan, and those following down toward the sea of the Erba, the salt sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. I don't know if you have that impression, but every time I read this passage about crossing the Jordan, I'm like, eh, you know, cool, right? But the Red Sea is the big thing. You know, you have this drama, you know, Pharaoh pursuing them, and the staff comes up and see all the movies and the kids the kids' uh, cartoons, and you see all this. I, my mind, I, I, can, I can go there. But when it comes to this Jordan crossing, we don't give the attention that we need. That, there are some nuances here like, that we need to, to pay attention to. The, the verb, the Hebrew verb for cross over is different than the one used in um, the crossing of the Red Sea. It's one commentator says that while walking through the waters of the Red Sea was both an escape and liberation, crossing over the Jordan meant entering a new kind of life into the promised land. So this is a new crossing. This is a new thing. It's not escaping from anything. It's getting into the promised land. So it's not only about the crossing, what we're seeing. Here. It's about the fulfillment of, God, of God's promise to his people. And the comment in verse 15 about the river makes it remarkably interesting and different, the perspective. 
in verse 15, it's saying that they, um, now the Jordan overflows all its bank. God chose the highest place of water and the highest season of time to cross the people there. It's like God saying, I am the mighty one. I can do anything. Nothing is impossible to our God. So it, it brings us back again to the verse 24 of chapter 4, right? So that, all, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This heap of waters in, in the city of Adam, which is mentioned here, was about 60 miles from where they were and stopped there. So the, the Levites, it's obeying the instructions of God. They're staying right there. So, and the people will cross. What I'm saying is like, it's the worst conditions of the river in terms of water. It's very inconvenient because it's a lot of people. Inconvenient for the Levites to stay there while the people will cross, but they're still obeying the Lord. They go and they cross. They, they need to fix their eyes on the ark. They need to hear how to pass there. And even if it's inconvenient, they must obey and follow. What will this uh, tell us about who our God is? Our God is great. Our God is big. Our God is powerful. Our God is a God of wonders. He is great in majesty and power. He is the true and only God. No one is like him. Nothing is impossible to him. His kingdom will advance in the world. His church will grow and multiply on the earth. Nothing can stop our God. Nothing can stop your God. This is our story. This sovereign God is also the one who gives us salvation, who sustains our sanctification, and he holds our eternal life. It's not, we do not hold our own salvation. If we would, we would lose it. It's only when we rest in the gospel and we rest in God that we can trust him. So I want to conclude saying that the story of Joshua can never be looked at without pointing to Jesus. That is what the Bible is about. And like that little puppy in the beginning of the story was afraid to be left alone, our souls should be feeling that when we don't come near our God. We should be constantly moving to the Word. We should be constantly seeking his wisdom and his counsel and be transformed by that. It's not about us every Sunday listening to a, a preaching for 40 minutes or so. It's about God's glory. And he is our general. He is our commander. He is our God. And we are here to serve. How can I serve? How can I dive into this world and, and, and be transformed? So may, may the Lord help us understand that we cannot go anywhere without his presence with us. Next time I preach, um, I intend to talk about the second part of the story, when they cross, which is actually one story, chapter 3 and 4, um, when they build the memorials, and they do that. But may our hearts um, be in this position that we cannot go anywhere without God, without Christ. So I'll give you a few seconds to reflect upon this word and ask that the Lord will change your heart, and then I'll pray for us.
Father, we are lost without you. We don't have the answers. We don't know what to do. We need your presence. We need your guidance. Lord, we want to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We want, as church, to look at you and trust you. We don't want to trust in ourselves. We don't want to trust in what we can do. We want to rest upon your faithfulness, upon your grace, upon your mercy. And we want to extend that to others so the world may see that you are a great God, that you are a merciful God. I pray that you would speak to us and change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.